The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room that's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, I'm Andrew Oxen. Welcome to another edition of the Engine Room Podcast. Um, I've got another in-person guest today who's flown all the way up from sunny Melbourne, um, the Borgian Rasaya. Welcome to the uh, podcast. Thanks, Roxy. Great to meet you in person for the first time and uh, see the crew again. Yeah, well, um, you know, you've, you've been loitering in our office and you, 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 kind of, you, you kind of know a fair bit about a lot of things. So I think today's podcast is, is going to be really insightful for people who may not know your story and may not know the other things that you've done, you know, ranging from, you know, all the way up to your role um, in the FAAA, you know, fighting the good fight and also running a very successful practice in, in Melbourne. So on that, uh, the listeners always like to know a little bit about, you know, how you've come to do this. And I've, I've, I've done a bit of stalking um, and you've been in this game for, for 20 odd years. Um, you look fantastic for, the, for that, uh, that tenure, well played. So uh, um, we, we, we've, got a, we've got a link, we normally start with links, a link to Mecca um, and a few of the other um, sort of uh, beautician products will yeah, probably be moisturizer, is it correct, the- correct. But maybe kick off with um, where you've come from because I, when I read your bio, um, it's, it's quite impressive. So, and just, and also take the time, and I don't normally ask this, but um, I reckon I can do it, take the time to sort of give us any lessons that you've learned along the way. Yeah, geez, we'll be here a long time for for the lessons. Yeah, look, Roxy, I mean it's the thanks for the for the great intro and the the resume or the the background, you know, it's all made up by the way. Um but but you know, we we always make things look a particular way, but it doesn't reflect all the challenges and how difficult the road often is and and the path changing and the pivoting you need to do along the way. But um you know, to start with, like a lot of advisors, I didn't plan to be an advisor to start with. What was your um, first passion? It was to do with money, but more on the investment side, you know, the sexy world of investment banking and um, equity analysis and all that sort of stuff. I used to love that um, and, and did some of that as a kid, you know, looking at, you know, stocks and that sort of thing. And um, It's a bit like every lawyer thinks that um, you know, all the law films are exactly what you do and they end up working in the back office for 20 years. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, when, when, when did you start? What was the year? So I uh, graduated in 97 from school, you know, did my commerce science degree, um, you know, your classic degree when you've got no idea what you want to do. You just do something really, really broad and try and figure it out. Um, I did get into more technical work through there in in finance, um, did honours in finance and econometrics, so statistical analysis of financial markets and things like that. So I did want to go into that investment banking side. But um, when I graduated, it was just after September 11. So none of those companies were hiring. Um, in fact, I couldn't get a grad- graduate job. Right. Um, so I decided to go backpacking for a few months, uh, which was great experience. Um, but did wa- did have to come back after about four months and get a job, uh, which was really challenging still at the time. And I'd heard of this thing called financial advice. In fact, I'd done some casual work with a, a family friend around a very, very small, just, just him, uh, financial advice practice. And it wasn't the sexy world of investment banking that I wanted, but it was what I did like about it was helping people. 
And reflecting back on it now, that's the thing that I'm so glad um, I ended up in this business because ultimately we're helping people. Um, you can make lots of money in lots of different ways and you can make businesses or employers lots of money, but, you know, when can you make an impact in the world and an impact in people's lives? That's kind of um, that probably starting point and that decision to move into an area that wasn't where I really wanted to go um, has influenced the way that um, we've run business and continued through advice. And I think you're right. I think the the commonality for most people in our industry is you get to make money with people, not money from people. And that kind of uh, collegiate, you know, everyone wins kind of philosophy is, is, is in reality what, what, what binds a lot of financial advisors and people listening um, uh, to, to this industry. Um, I often wish the, the general public would have a lot more sort of understanding that that is what motivates, um, uh, the vast majority, um, of, of advisors. So you then, um, did you, so wh- what was your first role in financial planning? So what happened was when I needed to get that, uh, look for a job, um, I applied for a bunch of roles and, you know, some of them were financial advice. I still didn't really know where I wanted to land and I ended up getting an interview, um, with a company and so yep put my hand up center yep book 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 the interview um and then uh was getting ready to go out to for the interview looking up the melways back then um and so uh, for the gen z the melways <laughs> is uh is like an ipad that has no electricity so um <laughs> it's, a paper, a, map it's a paper map isn't it <laughs> yes. yeah 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 and uh and um, where the interview was, it was an hour and a half away from where I lived. I was like, where is this place, Taralgon, um, which is in country Victoria? And uh, end up going out there and, yeah, they, they like me, was able to get a job in as an associate straight out of – as my first job in the um, in the industry. So it was a really steep learning curve, but um, that was my first job in a small planning practice with a couple of young – up and coming advisors that were really hungry and doing some really great stuff um, in a small country town, um, not your typical advice country um, advice practice. So were you were you um, were you a city guy who went to the country town? Is that your backstory? Yeah. yeah. So uh, what was it like when um, every single client is either related to or knows the previous client? How did you, how did you ingratiate yourself? Yeah, I was in the back office then, Roxy. Right. So I didn't have to yet learn how to connect with people at that yeah. point but I did learn a lot because being forced when when you do have to it, it's easier when you when you can do it as sort of a second chair rather than being the first chair if I was a first chair it wouldn't have worked but I had to learn people and I had to learn how to deal with people that were not like me yep. as well um, and people that look at you and so you know I'm a Sri Lankan um, background I was born and bred in Melbourne but you know I'm a short um, short dark guy and you know you go to a country town as a professional advisor this young kid um who's not like us typically and you get you know people thinking you know who is this guy yeah you know he's you know and 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 so trying to build that trust and learning how to do that um that became something that i had to work on and do you think it accelerated Um, your career absolutely yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and what, what, um, so you had to then, you know, obviously put yourself in the team. I mean, I'm from a small country town. And if I looked at my filing cabinet, if you weren't a Divine, a Donnelly or a Smith, um, you weren't in the cabinet. There was only three families, I think. So, you know, getting, and when did, when did you then, cause you started, um, your practice properly in 2017, the, the current incarnation. Is that mm, correct? That's right. And what's, how does Kevin um, Bailey fit into the picture? I've, I've read your backstory. Yeah, so after about twelve months out in Taralgon, I mean, I was I was um, basically living down there because it was too hard to drive back and forth an hour and a half each way, and it was just hard. It was just hard being away from my friends and my family and not really knowing having a community out there. So after about twelve thirteen months, I came back to Melbourne, and I was really fortunate that Kevin Bailey, um, one of the stalwarts in the industry, now retired. Um, his company, the money managers, recruit, was recruiting for a couple of roles. Right. Um, one of them was a client client services manager, you know, so entry level role, which was a step back from where I was in that um, country town uh, practice. But there was another role which was interesting, and when the CEO of the business was in um, was interviewing me, she actually suggested don't take this role, which is part of the bigger Kevin Bailey business, because I think. You've got something a bit different because because I'm very always been business minded and a bit entrepreneurial. She wanted me to go into another role, which was 
almost lower, but it was a jack of all trades to support an advisor that was working on a JV yep. with Kevin's business. Um, and oh, so an integration the, plan, was it? Yeah, it was, um, it was a subsidiary of the main money manager's practice. And, uh, so that was, that was a great opportunity to just learn how the whole business works. Um, because you're just involved in everything. And I was doing everything from licking stamps all the way up to sitting in front of clients. And because we were really, really small, when I went in, there was only 20 clients in that subsidiary practice. But that's how I got to know Kevin Bailey. And uh, he's always been a really great mentor of mine, still is. I see he's um, on your, your, your advice board in your, in your current state, yeah? Yeah, yeah, he is. He's, he's still someone that I go to when I need some advice and guidance on a whole lot of things, not just business, but life. And yeah, the the importance of having mentors and good people to learn from. I don't know what I'm doing, right? But okay, we're not going to finish the podcast. There. <laughs> we're going to try and unpack that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. I think. I think when when you think you've you've got it all figured out, that's when you get. Uh, for me, anyway, I believe that if you think you've got it all figured out, then. That it, you, know, you, you can't move forward, you can't improve, but but going in with a mindset of you know how can we do things better, what can I learn, um, how can we improve, that's been really helpful for me to challenge the status quo, do things differently, find a better way of doing everything we do in the business. Absolutely, and look, one of the great literary greats of, of the last hundred years, Mike Tyson, once said um, <laughs> that, that uh, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Um, and, you know, those punches can come from shocks uh, such as GFC, such as um, September 11, such as regulation. You know, you're, you're, uh, maybe we'll touch on that. You've, you've, been, you've been involved with the AAA and, um, uh, you know, a lot of people sit back um, in practice and go, oh, geez, I wish they would do this. Geez, I wish they'd do that. And some people even sit there with their popcorn, a bit like Waldorf and Stadler from the Muppets and criticise those people. But um, you lent in. So what was the stimulus? Um, you've been there for 14 years in various roles, assisting and guiding. What, what motivated you to do that? Because it's very much a, uh, you know, almost a social service for our industry. And thank you before you go on. Yeah, 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 right, Roxy. And, and, you know, more than happy to do it. I, I think when we're part of a profession and when, as, as advisors, we're giving people, we want to help people. And I, and I believe that part of our, if you look at true professions, um, my belief is that part of what we do is giving back to the community in some way. Um, and who are those, wh- what is that community? It might be the public, um, but it also might be a profession. And these are things that, again, I learned from uh, my mentors. So we mentioned Kevin Bailey. He was involved in the Financial Planning Association for a long time. David Heights as well, another mentor and, and friend who um, uh, who I saw recently still catch up with. And, again, someone who's very heavily involved in, in the industry and the profession at, in the well, Financial we're, Planning we're, Association. We're lucky enough to have interviewed David on this series and uh, – and, um um, yeah, he's his well. I think there's also a bit of a tether through the Shadforce backstory for you guys as well, or is that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So when I worked with Kevin Bailey, David Heinz's office was also in that same building. Right. So we used to, you know, catch up with their team, each other's teams, and then both Heinz Financial Services and the money managers, Kevin's business, um, were two of the businesses that merged to form Shadforth. Yep. But yeah, they're, those guys, you know, I saw these people giving back to the community and um, influencing and helping to make change. For the better, and and you're right. It is frustrating. You do see people who sit on the sidelines and um, have views on on what's working and what's not working, and and that's all okay. But you, you know, if you can't go in and and help and make make a change, then then you're just sitting on the sidelines and not doing anything. And it is a lot of time and commitment to be in involved in that. Yep. And, and what people don't realise is. Um, I'm, I'm, I also attend a conference um, here while I'm in Sydney and David Sharp, the chair of the FAAA, uh, he was telling people about what the FAAA has been working on and they've done something like 19 submissions to government and, and we're in March this, fun, this year. Um, and, and the amount of work and, and advocacy that the FAAA does is a huge amount. It doesn't mean that the FAAA can make things happen or, or make, make things um perfectly how we want. The government's going to dictate that, but the FAAA does a massive amount of work to actually make it much better than it would have been if we just left it to the government. To oh, if it's laissez-faire, then we, 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 we've got to sit back and take what, what you're taking. And, and, and you're right. Um, and, uh, you know, part of your backstory is, and I can hear the passion in your voice, is that 
that if you don't stand up for, for that and, and you're a passenger, then well, then you probably deserve the outcome of passengers, you know, rather than taking the, the thing. So when, uh, what was the moment that you decided to put your hand in your pocket and start your own practice? What was the, what was the, the, the event? Cause there's always something and sometimes they're negative and sometimes they're positive. What was yours? I remember it well. I was sitting in the office of, um, my manager who was the head of the state. Um, and, Shadforth were, you know, great business, great people. Um, but as we got bigger and ended up, you know, getting bought by OOF, now Insignia Financial, um, the, you know, it does shift. It does shift from a boutique feel to a larger, larger business. Um, and it's, you, you can't be as nimble in a larger business as you can be when you're a small business. And I found that <clears throat> there were things that I wanted to do. This is in, 2017 December when I when I left Shadforth to move on to um, start my own practice and I didn't do it because I just wanted to have my own business it actually came about because with the idea of always trying to improve like at Shadforth they got a great advice business great advice model um, but I always I wanted to do more and they're all, and that's something I learned from Kevin. Kevin was kind of at the bleeding edge, and even David Hyatt'swell used to see those guys introducing new ways of doing things. You know, not taking commissions, right? That was a very novel thing in the nineties to not not take commissions, um, but but doing some of these things like the genesis of rap platforms and things like that, and how you influence those things. You know, model portfolios, having control of 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 the funds that you that you recommend to clients for the benefit of them. Um, all these innovative things can only happen when you can experiment and try to do things for the betterment of your clients, the industry, the community, and business generally. So you've, that's a pretty very broad, broad positive statement there. And just changing gears to the mechanics of of how you – so that's your that's your big strategy or your big area audacious goals to, for the betterment of everyone. I didn't probably articulate that exactly the way you did it, but but that's where it is. And what I'd love to, I suppose, um, uh, get more information on is kind of how – how you go about doing that? Just a bit about your practice as it is as today. Um, we were talking um, off air earlier. You've, you've, uh, like a lot of businesses in our industry, you've been the charismatic frontman. You've done, you know, stuff on radio. You've attracted, you've attracted business to you. And at some stage, in order to scale your business up and to fulfill your ambitions, you have to bring in someone or, or partner with someone who has complementary skills. And you mentioned recently that um, you now have a, a chap called Peter Lee in your business. So maybe get a bit of a feel of what what, what Peter's role is and also then a, a bit more around the mechanics of, of your business. How's that sound? Yeah, great. So... So, g'day, Peter. Shout out to Peter Lee, our practice manager. Um, you better be listening. It's a KPI. <laughs> definitely is. Um, really, really important person in our business now. Before I get to that, just a, um, I didn't answer your question before. What was that moment that I made that shift? It was when my manager said, if you can't be the best advisor, you can be here and you want to be trying things to change how you do advice, then you really got to think about whether it's the right place. For you and, and that was very wise counsel. Um, so I started my practice I would, because I was a partner in the business. I didn't take any clients with me, you know, a bit of a couple of family members. Um, and when I started Reside Private, there was, you know, I didn't have I didn't have any clients, I didn't have any work, I didn't have anything to do. It was very private. Um, it was very <laughs> private. But the beauty about that was I wasn't getting bogged down doing financial planning. I now had a blank piece of Control paper. Control out reboot. Yeah. yeah. So, so we started with a blank piece of yeah. paper and said, how do we think we can serve people with money stuff? Can I ask you, what sort of people do you want to serve first? So what, what's the type, of, uh, the type of cohort of client that you think that you can do the best thing for? So we've got three criteria that we talk to clients prospective clients about so that we can determine whether we are a good fit for them and they're a good fit for us. And that's really important because we won't, we can't be all things to all people. We're really good in, in particular areas and, um, and we refer on other clients to other advisors where they're a better fit. Um, again, I think that's, that's where we're moving towards that as a profession where we take on people that are a good fit for us. So the three criteria that we have are firstly, are we aligned from a values perspective? Yep. What does that mean? The first part is we've got to like each other. We've got to feel like we can build trust and that's something we've got to earn. 
but we've got to be able to have that relationship and see it as a long-term relationship because we only want to work with people where we can have the biggest impact in their lives and we know that we have the biggest impact in people's lives when we work with them over a long period of time. I firmly believe that the longer we work with clients, the value that they get from the relationship goes up exponentially, which is why we don't do one-off pieces of work because the client doesn't get that much value so, so you're all in from that relationship. You're, they're all in for a long time. Is this yeah, the, uh, the approach, right? Yeah. So client, obviously they're never locked into anything, yep. but we approach that as in how can we be there with you to um, impact your life? So what's the second filter? So the other part of the, before the second filter, the other part of the values is that our job is not to make our clients rich. Our job is to help our clients live the best life they can according to their values and according to their purpose. So it's a very, very values-based sort of outcome-based or even goals-based strategy. Is that correct? It's bigger than goals. So we talk about goals a lot and there's goals-based advice. Um, I remember Fraser Jack used to do the goals-based advisor podcast back in the day. Um, but we be- – so, so as a firm, goals are great, but I believe you've got to go higher than goals because if you ask a client what their goals are, they just tell you what you want to hear. Oh, I want to retire at 65 with 100,000 a year and I want to do this and I want to do that. But is that actually what they want? So we think that when we talk about values and purpose, we actually get to the underlying drivers that uncover the things that are actually most important to people and then you can put goals around it. And you've been talking a bit about using the reference we. Does that mean that when a client comes into your practice, um, they're, they're seen with a team of people? Absolutely, yeah. So what? Well, I know we haven't done the second filter, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what's the team look like? So our team now is seven. So so six years ago, I started the practice just myself, yep. and then obviously we've grown over time. Yeah. So there's myself, um, Simone. Shout out to Simone Murray, um, who's our other senior advisor. Yep. Um, CPA qualified accountant, thirty five years experience, absolute gun advisor, great person as well, and. She's the person who does, you know, all our strategy, all our complicated work, yep. all the technical stuff. So you would um, you would you would work on things as a team, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And just, just go to whoever's got the skills and, and whatnot. Yeah, okay. exactly. And that's what we tell clients, you know, we okay. work for you as a as a team. Because, you know, and, and sometimes clients think clients think that they want me as the advisor. But I've got to remind them, you don't want me. You want Simone to be building a awesome, complicated tax strategy that's gonna put Hundreds of thousand of dollars it's in your pocket. It's also the curse of the rainmaker because, um, you know, as flattering as it is to be wanted all the time, you also run out of time and you've got to, you know, look yourself in the mirror and go, well, can I genuinely do this thing for this family? Yeah, that's right. And, and you know, am I the best person to execute on that thing? Yep. Um, we've got Niv in the business who's our client relationship manager. She's the best person to get things done for our client. So yep. the best person to do the technical advice. Niv's the best person to get things done with our offshore team who supports her. Um, but if clients are relying on me to get something actually executed, I'm not the best person to do that. So I'm um, going to jump back to the filters quickly. Yes. What's the second filter? And then I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions in relation to your org structure because if I'm if I like what I hear in this podcast and, and uh, you know, I want to – in, uh, you're in Collins Street, Melbourne, correct? Yes, that's Is that right? right? That's yep, right. Yep. And um, it's sort of one of the places to be um, as far as this industry um, in that state in particular for that private wealth um, uh, sort of experience. Um, I want to see if I can – if, if, if the environment you're talking about, the team structure and whatnot works for me. So what's the second filter? So the second filter in terms of how we um, – determine whether we're a good fit for clients the first is the values alignment Um, the second one is does the client have enough complexity that we can add value for them so we're looking for clients where we can add a lot of value for them because we've got a highly experienced team with a lot of um, expertise as well and um, again we want to do impactful work so what's what's a complex client look like is that you mean self-employed you mean um, multi-generational wealth have they had a nasty divorce like well what's 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 practically that that's a great question roxy um because we simplify things down to things that because it's easier to understand when we simplify things but complexity comes in so many different forms um the obvious ones are you got lots of money right that brings complexity you got lots of income that brings lots of money you got a business you got lots of structures and we're really good helping those people. Yeah. But you've also got 
complexity, which is sometimes harder complexity where people can't make, you know, a couple can't make financial decisions together because they don't communicate well or there are complex family issues or personal issues or people just don't have the time. No one likes that son-in-law. <laughs> he, he doesn't. He turns up with rubbish presents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's that perceived complexity. So yeah, I agree. what we tell the client is, if if you don't think your affairs are complicated, then you can probably do it yourself. Then why would you pay us? Yeah, okay. okay. But so, if you've got complexity, then we can we can remove that complexity and solve yeah, that for yeah, you. Yeah, and I suppose it also it also um, uh, you can demonstrate value, and you can also demonstrate real empathy, right? So, and. Uh, for a lot of these people who have very complex affairs and, and, and relatively wealthy people, they might think they're the only person or the only couple going through it because they might not be in those circles. But, you know, you're probably going to see another one at three o'clock this afternoon. So you can give them that real confidence mm. that, that we've got you, you know, like we've, we've, that thing that you think is unusual. We just did, we've done half a dozen mm. in the last six months. So, mm. so complex clients. And what's the third filter? The third one's affordability. So this is obviously an issue in the industry, accessibility and affordability to advice. Um, and we've got no interest in charging people where they can't afford our services or it's not a good, <laughs> it's not good financial advice for them to pay for financial advice maybe. Um, so, so we'll help people figure out what the right solution is and sometimes that's not with us. Um, we do refer some of our um, younger clients to Fox and Hare. Uh, so shout out to Glenn um, who runs that business Uh because some, some clients aren't a good fit for us, so we refer them there. Uh, we also refer clients to other resources if um, if that's what's best for them. Yeah, we uh, spoke earlier. You can say it. I mean, we can go off piece a bit here, but you've, you've, you've built a digital platform that, um, that, that that is attempting to service that. It's called, it's called Finito. It's maybe just, I know that we're talking about your practice, but this is another one of your passion pieces. Maybe get us a bit of a feel for the purpose behind that. Yeah, so Finito's become a it's, a... it's a Which we'll put it in the links as well, guys, yeah? Yeah, it's a, it's a purpose... It's, it's a for-purpose business um, and basically it came about because I found that all these people that are coming to us for help with their money, our industry isn't structured in a way to serve them. Number one, well, we don't have enough advisors. And filter three, they can't afford it because of right. our cost of cost of, to, cost that's of it. delivery. That's right. That's it. So, so uh, Finito, which... Um, what you build is, is is sort of a scaled uh, ability to, to to help these people for for that maybe to bridge them until they can get to the stage where they can be serviced by by a practice. Um, yeah, practice. maybe, maybe, yeah. but but you know, it's going to take decades before we've got enough advisors to advise all Australians. Right? No, it's so, not because they're all going to listen to this podcast and tell their friends. It's a great, it's a really great vocation in life, and you help people. Mm-hmm. We'll be flooded. You know? <laughs> that's right. That's Might just right. take one decade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, until we've got enough advisors, there's going to be people who won't be served. Yep. Um, and, and so what we're using is the intersection of technology, expertise, and the community to deliver um, the help that people need with money um, Perfect. in the way that they need it. So that's through content. It's through conversations with experts, but not advice. Um, most advisors will know, most really good advisors will know that um, it's not the product solutions that – um, are the things that help clients. It's helping them clarify their values, their goals. Yeah, uh, navigating the peace world. Of mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, helping them understand yeah. what they need to do, but also what they don't need to do um, and where they need to focus and, and, and a bit of education along the way as well. So Finito is a great place that um, any advisor can send now with confidence knowing they're sending them to a trusted place to get that help. Yep. Um, there's no cost for the consumer to, to register and get access to, to those resources. Um, and then they can, you know, purchase, you know, additional, more complex resources if they want. But yep. the consumer's in full control to engage with the money in the way that they want to without needing full financial advice. I mean, I'd love for every, every person to be getting financial advice. Um, but it's, it's just impossible at the moment. Well, you know, from, from the outset, getting to know you around, you know, you've, 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 you've put your money where your mouth is in relation to um, policy and helping the industry that way. You put your money where your mouth is in, 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 in relation to helping the people that, that can't afford full financial advice. And I wish that the government would listen more to, to people such as y- yourself in saying that. But getting to your actual practice, the nuts and bolts, um, uh, how do you operate? I mean, who are you licensed with? What's your tech stack? And what role does Peter play? Because it sounds like you've got a fair bit on. Yeah, so a couple of years ago, I came across a book that was um, – a bit of a game changer. Uh, it's called Rocket Fuel by Gino Wickman, a guy out, a guy out of the US. So, so say it again. Rocket Fuel by Gino Wickman. We'll put in the links, everyone. He's got another book called Traction. 
so rocket fuel and traction and it's about running how to grow small businesses and ultimately what they talked about is every business to to have the rocket fuel to grow you need to have a visionary which is the person that sets the direction the culture of the business thinks of all these ideas you know all that sort of thing that was a short election in your business that's right <laughs> um but you also need someone who's going to get everything done someone who's really organized someone who can do the process and the systems and all that sort of thing um and that was something that i lacked um because halfway through doing something i would naturally get onto the, you know see something else and trying trying a different angle for it or whatever so um, that's where I brought Peter Lee into the business and we started operating on this model where um, he's the one that uh, makes sure that we're doing the things and puts structure around how we do everything in the business. Um, and we, tr- we were do- applying the principles from the books um, ourselves, um, but then after talking to a can- an accountant who uses the similar system talked about in the books called the Entrepreneurial Operating System, EOS. EOSworldwide.com. We we uh, we started working with a with a business coach who who who, um, who is part of that EOS network. Okay, and are you um, still working with that business coach? We are. Yep. Yeah, give him a right. shout out. Yeah, that's Matt Matt Gold uh, down in Melbourne. Um, he's what's called an EOS implementer, um, and starting to work with Matt was a game changer for us because he gave us all the frameworks that we needed to do what we were doing, but in a much more structured, better way um, with all the tools. And so we're learning all of those tools. And Peter, Peter Lee from Office of Practice Manager, he uh, basically runs all of that and makes sure that we're um, sticking to the structure so that we focus on the right areas of the business that well, we need well, to. Let's get more to making sure that you're sticking to the structure. And it's called founder angling, right? So, <laughs> so the uh, entrepreneurial uh, operating system, um, you know, I'm looking at it here. It's, it's, it's vision, um, data, process. Traction, issues, and people, getting the right people doing the right things at the right time. Um, but the leverage point around that is is utilizing technology correctly. In your in your practice day to day, what what's the what's the tech stack? At the moment, um, so we're licensed with FYG planners. Um, yep. you did ask that question before. Um, that's an important decision that we've made, which is not to self license. And the reason we haven't self licensed is because you got I mean, a bit on. Yeah, this, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we've got a bit on. And to run a license properly, there's a lot of stuff you've got to do. And well, I, I was an RM for many, many years and, um, yeah, it's the booby prize. Um, so uh, there is a lot of stuff, but you do need you need dedicated resources. So, exactly you right. know, you, you've got a few swim lanes and um, you want to swim, not drown. So yeah. you've got to make the right decision. So when we were deciding, well, when I was deciding when I first started the business, what where do we want to be focusing on? It was we want to be doing the best job for our clients, yep. um, not running compliance. Yep. And so we partner with FYG Planners uh, run by Peter Mansell. Um, Andrew Wooten runs that business now as well. Um, shout out to them. And- we partner with them as a licensee because they're just great people. Um, people is so important, but they're, they're very, very ethical. Um, everything's clean, no conflicts. Um, and yeah, they provide us with the support that we need to be the best we can as a business. Uh, they don't have, don't have all the answers, but they're there to support us in the way that we need. Um, and that's that's really critical for us to have that flexibility as well. So um, we're licensed with FYG planners. One of the things that they've done, moved away from X-Plan and um, building it, the CRM with Microsoft Dynamics. Okay. Um, so is that that's uh, is that done or that's what they're doing? They've they've uh, they've built the 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 building the the foundational okay. block I guess I don't yeah. I'm not a I'm not a tech guy so no I'm really um, interested because you know we do a lot of these podcasts and and um, uh, there's almost a a a, a, a fait accompli of the the three or four types of um, pieces of technology that's mm. used um, Microsoft's. Microsoft's new platform, you know, right from the Teams to the, well, to the just the operating system they run, the 365, the, the, the Copilot, it's seriously powerful. A lot of people talk about Salesforce and that does a good job, but I'm just, this might be the first podcast where people are building it on a Microsoft platform. Kieran and Siango, is that, yeah. Is it? Yeah, I hadn't heard of it before either, but I think it's really smart. I think it's, it's, it's sort of very, um, forward looking. So if you think about the future and where technology is going, um, you have data lakes, you want to capture everything, integrations. Um, and I mean, Microsoft, if, if you're going to integrate 
Microsoft's going to be able to do it um, and the innovation and the investments that are going into it with the use of things like AI and Copilot there, um, you know, that's that's really exciting to see what that could become um, from a CRM perspective. Well, the big thing is, is that ultimately when we get to the nuts and bolts of a practice, it comes down to can you manage more family? Like you, you, you're you, after complex families and I'd be interested what your thoughts are on how many complex families your business and 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 an AR and your business can run. That's the first question. And what do you think this advancement that your uh, AFSL is leading will, will increase it by? I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I you, you might have heard of Dunbar's principle, um, which I believe is um, that we can have. I think it's 160 relationships or 150 relationships um, as advisors. So I do hear some. I interview a lot of people. That's that. That would be a stretch for a lot of them. Um, a lot of them are now have got complex families. Yeah, they would love to get there. And yeah. in fact, anything over 120 almost hits the bottom line. Yeah, yeah. you know. So, exactly. so they all want to be there. And yeah. um. So yeah. But but it's interesting because I do hear in the industry people talking about if we use technology, you could serve 300, 400 families, um, which I don't. I don't believe is is possible to have a really deep impact for relationship with that many people what we do i believe want to use technology for is to enable us to find find more efficient ways to add more value to the relationships that we've got so so adding that value to those clients um but using technology to enable that so we've built an advice model which is um i believe somewhat unique so we don't run reviews and we don't do annual reviews or um, annual meetings, you know, once-year engagements. You just had people career off the road if they're listening to this in their car. <laughs> so um, how's the cadence work? So, I mean, is that is that um, also a function of how you um, you charge your clients or, or – It does, does, to, it it does to a certain extent. I mean, yeah. the way that we charge, um, I can go into our cost philosophy, but ultimately it's we need to add way more value to our clients than the cost to them. So we don't charge on time, nothing like that. It's about how much value can we add to you and we have to be super confident that we can add a significant amount of value over and above the fees we need to charge. Mm -hmm. Um, And our service model is built around that. So we've moved away from let's review the last year or let's review the last quarter um, to what we call the Reside Private Client Journey. And what that journey looks like is it's four pillars that make up that client journey, four pillars during the year. And we, there are four distinct pieces of work that we will do for every one of our clients during the year. So they're going to have a, a, a tangible thing delivered to them every quarter. Correct. And, it, and, and what's that tangible thing? It's, that's interesting as well. It doesn't mean that we just give them something unless it's valuable. Yep. So um, the, the four pillars are the four key areas that we believe make up. The, the most important parts of the advice um, that we give. So one is the planning part. So reconfirming values and purpose, setting the goals for the year, resetting. And um, that's purposely intentionally done in February every year for every single client. So again, we've moved away from staggering annual reviews through the year based on an anniversary date, which is a compliance construct. So we've said every client renews the relationship at the beginning of the year. And, okay. And we re-engage at that point. Yep. Um, we also plan ahead for the year. And why do we do that? Well, we come out of the holidays where everyone's got their New Year's resolutions before life gets too busy during the year. That's the best time to be thinking about, about it. And you know that when you <clears> – <throat> we know this as advisors that when, you, when you're talking to a client at the beginning of the year, their mindset around planning is very different to when you talk to them middle of the year um, or later in the year because yep. – they're already tired from the year. Um, so it's the best time to set plans for the year and what needs to happen. So we do that in um, in uh, in February. Yep. We reset, reset the value purchase. And you re-engage in February? Yep. Re-engage and we build, do some financial modeling with them, yep. do the cash flow modeling, show them what the future is going to look like, which is essentially going to answer the question, are we going to be okay? Yep. Which for a lot of our clients, that's all they need. That's what they want from us. But you've got three other touch points. We do have three other touch yeah. points because we're advised and there's lots of value we can add. Yep. Um, so the, the second pillar is in May. Yep. And what do we do in May? Tax planning. Right. Again, people meet with their clients on the anniversary so, so, date. Which so you're actually be- doing it before uh, the cutoff. Okay. That's interesting. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah, makes sense, doesn't yep. it? When should you do your tax planning? 
like probably when you before do 30 June, it. right? Correct. Correct. So, so we review every client's affairs strategies, tax strategies, superannuation yep. strategies in in May. And and Simone, um, our technical gun, she does that for all our clients, looks at financial statements, um, contacts every client yep. for what they need to do. So we give them advice around that. Um, in August, we uh, evaluate the investment strategies our clients have. Why do we do it in August? Because we can use fully audited financial year reports. Plus, crashes generally happen in September. Before that. <laughs> <laughs> or October. Yeah, that's um, it. Yeah, so, but, but that's the best time to benchmark yeah. your portfolios. Yeah. Um, make sure that we're measuring things, comparing them, showing our clients how their, perform, their, their portfolios have gone compared to alternatives in the marketplace, um, but doing it with audited results. Yep. Um, so, so we do can, that Can I August. jump in and ask a question about investment? Yes. Because we haven't touched on it and you, you know, right back, way back when you, you know, you're qualified, you've done econometrics, right? So, mm. um, and we will come back. We're still in August, everyone. So just put a pin in August. Um, quite cold and miserable there in Melbourne in August, I would hasten to say, at least you've got so the Aussie is. rules to, to light your way. But um, at, what's your, do you run an SMA, an, I, an IMA? Do you, do you, do you what platforms do you use? How do, how do you invest money? Because you are you are going for the, the wealthiest structured people. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Um, when we – some of that is about execution and the execution is simply what works best for the – for the client or, or, or what? what's the best way to get that thing done, right? Yeah, but that's you talking. But Peter's probably like, can we also have it within our narrow range of workflows, please? Absolutely. Yeah. And so you want to you simplify, you want to structure things in a way that, it, that the client knows what to expect, but your yep. team also knows what to expect and you can deliver it in a consistent way that you know works. And what are the tools that you which, – which, what are the – have you got any favorites out there who are most align with how you operate? Yes. Yeah, so using, again, with my um, econometrics finance background, we learned all about, um, you know, the pharma French model, the CAPM model, what works with investing. We learn all this stuff in uni and then you get into the big bad world and then, you know, we're out there selling products or selling, you know, stocks or whatever. Um so we use an academic research evidence based way of investing. Um, I mentioned Pharma French. They're actually um, part of the dimensional funds business over in the US as well. And so we do use an investment philosophy that aligns with dimensional is the is the best fund manager that executes that gotcha. philosophy. Yep. Um, and so we use some of them um, for that. But it's not because we believe in. It's not about dimensional. It's about the actual philosophy. Yeah, but they're, but they're doing But they execute it really well. Correct. And then what about platform? Platform at the moment, we use Macquarie Wrap. Okay, and so again, you said at the moment. So if poor, poor old Macquarie BDMs listening to this going, what's going on? Are you get a phone call? Why I say at the moment? Because we don't think that everything's always going to be the bright, the solution. But even if we keep using, even if we use Macquarie for the next 20 years, we never want to just be using it just because that's what we do. That's right. right. I mean, so you we've always the got right the tech at the right time. Yeah, we've got the perspective of just because we do something now doesn't mean that's yep. always going to be the best way. Yeah. Um, but Macquarie has been been a really good platform that's worked worked really well for us and our clients. Oh, no worries. And look, I interjected there. So we're back to August. So just for um, you, you, you kick off in February, because I'm going to ask a, a question in a second that um, that we haven't rehearsed. Um, uh, we haven't rehearsed any questions, but you mightn't like this one because I'm going to throw a spanner in the works. But um, we're now at August. We've got the investment. Um, you've given us an overview. You've made us feel comfortable. And the... the the end of the year is hard to get clients. I mean, after you know the this, what is it, whatever Melbourne Cup is, they mm. they quite often drift off into their very well earned breaks. So, what's the last meeting all about? Yeah, that's right. So, the last meeting is about risk management, and and I guess in advice world, your your classic risk management areas are uh, asset protection, estate planning, life insurance. They're all forms of asset protection. Yep. I guess. Um, and the reason we do it in November is because when we're talking about those issues, we're talking about things going wrong. And and family stuff's coming up. Family over stuff's Christmas coming quite up. Often. Yeah, yeah. Who are you going to talk to yep. after that time? So we deliberately position it in November because we're talking about life insurance, estate planning, asset yep. protection, and our clients get a lot of – they they always come out of those conversations with something to talk about their loved ones with. And so it's a perfect timing. Okay, so for, for that. so my, my curly question is, um, what if you're a new client? 
So a new client comes in, you did a strategy piece and do you, do you, do you just happen to fall into the, the normal cadence and of the way you guys are doing it or how does it work? You know, you, I'm assuming you're taking lots of new clients. You've got, um, you know, a, a decent funnel of business through your, your, your reputation. If we're, how the yeah, new we, can, we get lots of inquiries, which is a nice, nice, um, situation to be in. Um, I think it's just from building the, the personal brand over the years, but, um, We'll, we'll talk to, we'll, we'll talk to everyone, even if they're not going to be a good fit. Again, that's part of our helping people doing the right thing by the community. You know, having a 20 minute conversation with me is going to add a lot of value for the client, even if they don't become a client. And so, so through that process of finding whether a client's a good fit or not, reflecting on the three criteria, if a client decides that we are a really good solution to help them achieve the, the things that are most important in their lives according to their values and their purpose, then we basically say, well, you know, and, and I think we overcomplicate this in the in our industry, where we're ultimately trying to get a client to commit to purchase an SOA. That's kind of the construct that we're under. Whereas the the way that we angle it, we'd say, Roxy, what's happening in your life? Do you need help with something? Well, that's why you're here, right? That's why you contacted us. Obviously, you need some help with something. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Um, if we assess that there's a fit for criteria and affordability, then we'd say we can help you. F- with that thing, and this is what it's going to cost. And do what, when, once that, so once the the family or, or the, the the individual says yes, um, do you just backfill the you know the, the the February sort of engagement, which is the cash flow planning, the tax planning, the investment, and sort of do a sort of a, a, a big piece of work up front? Then you put them into the regularity in the second year onwards or whatever of the of how you run your business. Is that correct? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty okay. much. So we kind of bring bring together all those building blocks down to one. Sometimes we will um, – it will just happen to be that they contacted us in um, in March and one of the things we're going to need to do for them is tax planning anyway, so yep. they would naturally fit into that so in, tax cycle. In um, February, you, you, you're then getting them to commit to – uh, you know the next body of work, the next annual body of work. As you've said, that's the re-engagement. So, um, geez, you must have a lot of work in February if you're trying to get through all of those clients. You've you've got, you know, we're all when you've got to get clients to recommit and, and do that. You've got to demonstrate value, and and you've got to. The big thing is you actually just have to get hold of them. Mm. So, is a big part of when you engage a client is saying these are the four pillars, these are the four times. Um, Please make yourself available, or tell us that you're not going to be, um, because from a from a, a cash flow perspective, from whatnot, if they don't sign off on on wanting you to be retained for the following year, then then you know the the, the tap turns off, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I can see why it would seem like that, and I was really worried about that. Um, the pleasing thing, if we use this year as an example, because what we're in March, so last month we were working very hard, um, meeting with all of our clients. The re-engaging was the easiest part of it. And and are you doing that via um, this uh, Microsoft platform at this stage or, or what's what's the mechanics of you doing the, the re-engagement? That's a really good question, Roxy, which I don't know the answer to. So Peter, my practice manager, he runs all of that. Right, okay. So, you, so as the advisor, I don't have to worry about the mechanics of how those things happen. I just have to talk to the client and help the client. So the way we've structured the business now, and, and we've got seven in the team, which is a really – big team. We're over-resourced for a business with 93 clients. Um, and we've spent the last 12 to 18 months setting up that infrastructure so that we can pretty much double the number of clients with maybe adding a little bit of extra resource, but not too much. Well, let's talk about how they might be listening. So what's what's the goal, boss? What's uh, So you'd like to double the amount of clients. Um, you've built you've, you've built the capacity cup. I'm not sure what language the uh, EOS does, but but capacity cup. You built the cup, um, and what's what's the sort of the, the the target to to do that? So the end goal is that the ten year the the big the big hairy audacious goal the BHAG is to have uh, you know you know ten advisors in the business. Yep. Uh, looking after a hundred families each round round figures, um, and that enables us as a business to be helping people in an impactful way um, and more of them. Uh, it would be much easier to just stick with what we've got and do that. But it's that. not. It's not, though, because um, if, 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 you've, if you're the key person and something goes a wobble, you have a health scare, you Correct. have a family scenario, like it's all good until you get punched in the face. Exactly right. right? So, so almost 
it, it almost requires to lower your risk as a business, you need to take risk to grow the scale of your business, which might include, you know, either obtaining capital or leverage in order to reduce your risk. It's a, it's a really wild mm. scenario, which is not just, you know, idiosyncratic to, to, to financial mm. services, to be honest. And your position, so I've gleaned out of you that you'd like to get to 10 people doing that, which would be amazing, based in Collins Street, looking after a, a sort of a client base. I love the four individual ones. My background um, at my, my planning firm over many years, we were a multi-discipline practice. Um, we had tax planning. We had our estate planning. So so everything you're, you're, you're saying is, is absolute music to my ears. Potentially when we started, you know, 25 years ago, the rigors around ongoing engagement weren't as, weren't as clear cut. And it was very much we almost did an opt out rather than an opt in every year, which mm. has changed over the last ten years. And I, I'll, I'll grant you that it is a more difficult process, albeit that um, you, your practice manager over it. But if I'm then thinking about um, what it looks like to work inside your business, um, I like to ask three questions. You know, why do people join you? Um, why do they stay, and, and and how do they grow? And so maybe get a bit of a feel for um, uh, that, that sort of advisors to start with. Um, that, that would join your practice. Um, and then I'd love to hear about, you know, do you have a work from home policy? I mean, you are a fellow Victorian with a lot of other Victorians who were told to stay home for, I think, 50 years <laughs> by your, your, your leader in chief. Um, I was down in Melbourne only, um, you know, yesterday. Um, it is coming back to life, but yeah. So, so give me a feel for what it looks like to be an advisor in your business. Yeah. So with, for, for our, for our team, and again, it's not about just the advisors. So. Um, everyone in the team is a really important part of the solution for our oh, clients. Oh, let's do a metaphor. What's a sporting metaphor? So it's Formula One. We can do Formula One. We can do cricket. We can do football. You pick. We do. What yeah, Formula like? One's Formula One. Formula good. One. Formula Given One. Given we've got the Grand Prix this weekend in Melbourne. There you go. Let's do a Formula One metaphor. So let's talk about the pit team. Yeah. So the pit team. It's so important to have that support, and we've we're, we're, we've got an offshore team as well. Uh, you can the, give them a shout out. In the Philippines, uh, we do use VA Platinum. Um, VBP is obviously another great operation. Yeah, shout out to uh, Brian and the team over there. And they're not just um, they're not just outsourced services for us. They're literally part of the team. So we'll be they'll they'll be talking to people in Melbourne every every day, um, and they, they engage with clients as well. So clients get to know them as well. Uh, we went over and visited them over Christmas um, last year. Uh, one of the girls got married, so um, we took the whole Melbourne team, went over with our families, uh, spent spent a few days with um, uh, with our team over there, and um, uh, went to a wedding. And uh, it was great, you know, getting that cultural connection was it's really good. good. Absolutely, and, I, and I'm just going to do a sidebar for um for for those of you practice owners who, who, who have either thinking about um, utilising people offshore or, or, or currently do it, caring about them and caring so much you've taken your team to see them and, and treating them as people is the key. Many people ask me that um, about how it works. I'm, I'm a big client of that. That um, you know, I've got sort of dozens of people who work for me um, overseas in my other businesses um, and getting them to feel like they're part of your team, which you've just intimated. And I'm reiterating that because if we can just get one practice to actually change their behaviour and lean in on a personal level, well, it lifts the whole industry. As we intimated before, it's going to take decades to replenish the AR stocks. But I think there's about 16,000 ARs in Australia, but there's about 150,000 people who work inside those businesses. So there's a, there's a, there's a bunch of uh, very good looking guys and girls who drive the race cars, but there's a army of people who build them, maintain them, and, um, you know, work and strive for the efficiency to make them go better and faster. Would you agree? 100%. And I think one of the things that, that we've done very, um, for a bunch of reasons, um, you talked about, you know, something goes wrong or something happens to the advisor, what happens to the client? It's not just about the value of the business, but the client. How's the client going to be best served? So for us, it's really important that the client's got a relationship with a number of people in the business. Again, different people in the business are going to be better to serve the client than the advisor in particular areas. Uh, well, especially across the four different things you do on a yearly basis, exactly right? right. So, so, you know, sometimes tax planning is quite binary. binary. You yeah. know, this is the tax law. This is where you're at. This is the 
position piece, right? It's not as much as we we like to romanticise the ATO. It's not interpretive dance. Mm-hmm. Quite often, it's a binary outcome. That's right. That's right. And so, having having that infrastructure, having the team that we are all connected with, um, the team that understands the clients, uh, they're not just cookie cutter churning out stuff. They're actually embedded in the core values of the business. Uh, we do our um, yearly planning with the team and, and the offshore teams involved in that, setting the culture, setting the, the values of us, of, of the business. Uh, that offshore team is just as important as anyone else. And it's a heap of fun traveling over to, uh, to Cebu to meet your team as well. Yeah, so there's no yeah, doubt about that. Definitely. Now, how do you have fun? Like, so what actually, before I come, let's get to, sorry, we'll jump straight to the fun bit. You're rubbing off on me. <laughs> um, You've given us an overview of, of the team behind the team. You've, you've, you've reiterated the philosophy that, that it's a team that, that services the clients. But what are the, what are the meeting rhythms? You know, what's the cadence around the engine that, that, um, that runs the business? You know, how, how do you operate? Is it daily? Is it weekly? Give me a bit of a feel, especially against a backdrop of some quite tight turnarounds based on your four pillars. This is where EOS has really helped us. Knowing how to run a business in a way, in a structured way, so that we're not constantly trying to figure out how to do things. So, how often do you see your coach before I? Quarterly. Quarterly. Okay. So, you're doing quarterly. I think they call them rocks, which is a bit self-serving for me, but uh, um, might want to change that word eventually. Yes. Yeah. Coaching world. But um, yeah. So, you, you're seeing your, so you're doing 90 day plans. So, do 90 day plans. Yep. yep. Um, so, that's, that's the strategy. But, but every day, what does the, what does the, the cadence of, of, of the op- machine look like? So, there's, there's multiple parts to, to the EOS system, which has really helped us. Um, and, and we used to do different versions of it ourselves. Um, EOS, there's nothing in EOS that's, that's, uh, that you haven't seen in other coaching systems or um, business growth books or whatever. But what it does is it gives us a very tight framework to just follow to help us to execute it. So we've got an accountability chart. Um, it's, it's a bit like an org chart, but it's more about who is accountable for the different things that need to be done in the business. And what happens when everyone's accountable for everything? Does it work? Nothing gets done, right? Correct. So That's- we've got a we've got a clear accountability chart. I remember when I first started the or even before I started the the business six years ago, it was just me, obviously, but I had an org chart with about twenty boxes and my name was in all of them. Oh classic. But- well well my business coach was Dave Carney is now my business partner and and uh, we were even worse. We had my name uh, sorry we had someone else's name slash my name in all of them, which is was I letting go? Mm. Or was I confident they could do it? So it was a disaster. And so, you know, mm. where do you sit today? Is it? Yeah, and that's one of the hardest things to do is to let let things go, trust other people. Um, not because you don't trust them, but the letting go is the hard part. Yeah, it can come across as you don't trust them, but it's it's actually yeah. Are you willing to let let things go? And so that accountability chart um, consists of different parts. It's got the, you know, the parts to run the business, which is like the sales and marketing. You have the finance side. And then we have the core operations, which is the advice delivery. So in that operations part of the business, which Peter is, Peter Lee, our practice manager, runs, we then have an advice team and we have a client services team. Gotcha. And the advice team is accountable for certain outcomes for the client. The client services team is accountable for certain outcomes for the client. Um, and that gets that gets measured and rewarded quarterly. Is that correct? Is that, is that when you celebrate milestones or success? Not necessarily. Um, it's when we, we we try to celebrate wins all the time. Yep. So whenever and 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 the biggest wins for us are clients, you know, raving about how good good a job someone's done for them, or or something impactful that's had in their life. From a business perspective, uh, we do look at the financials, and and you have you have. You know, good and bad quarters, things move around. So when you You've say, got, where do you share your financials with your team? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. And yeah. how does that look? How does that look? Yeah, how does it look? A, I mean, does you, does it, is it on a, a quarterly basis? You get, here's our operational uh, metrics. Um, here's the consequences of, of the financial metrics. And, you know, it leads me on to things such as, um, uh, you know, as you're looking to scale this team, you mentioned your BHAG of 10 people. Well, Oh, 10, 10, 10 key advisors, which means you probably got an iceberg of 50 team members in total, some of which are, are here and some of which will be abroad. Mm. Um, uh, and, and those ambitious people who would love to be part of that, 
you, they don't want to operate in a vacuum. They want to see, well, what, what, what is it that I do on a daily basis and how does it affect the P&L? So you're saying that, that, that you'll be open to, you know, participating in, in, in disclosing how things work and what their impact is? Yeah, I think when you think of, when, you, when you've got a clear vision as to what you're trying to achieve and um, it's a bit like how we advise our clients, we need to um, be help have our clients be clear on their vision so that we can execute the strategies they need to financially. So as advisory businesses, I think it's we, we, we sometimes don't take our own advice. So as advisory business, have we got our, our vision set? Have we got a 10-year target? Are we doing a financial plan for the business? Oh, if you don't have a coach or you've got a plan, right. then good, you know, you're going to get what you get. Exactly right. And so when when you look at that, it, it then naturally leads to things like, what is that vision? Why do you exist as a business? There's a fantastic book that I um, read recently by Simon Sinek uh, called The Infinite Game. And it, it talks about the central premise being that business doesn't have a end point with a winner. So it's not a game of footy where you where where at the end you've got a winner and a loser. Um, but we tend to treat a lot of the things that we do in life like a game, like a game that stops. But if you think about business, there's no best business. So so sometimes businesses have have a goal to be the best. But for now is what it, we're going to be the best for now. What's going to happen? That business that's the best is never going to always be the best unless you've got that ultimate vision set. And that ultimate vision needs to be about the impact you're going to have in the world ultimately. Yeah, so I think if that's your focus, then you can create the business to to achieve that. And that often means bringing other people in um, because no individual can, can have that impact themselves. Um, you know, I believe you have to do it with other people. You have to bring people along the journey and people need to be part of that execution of that vision. And if that's, you know, having a smaller piece of a bigger pie, bringing other owners of the business so that, um, so that that you, you can exponentially, um, benefit from the growth as a business, but also have a broader impact towards your vision as well. Yeah, you're right. I mean, look, the, uh, the, the engine room podcast, indeed, you know, if I track back on ensembles all throughout the positive evolution of financial advice and why I took this role, um, of, of talking to people on, um, is that uh, the best pit crews are going to um, uh, enable the, the advisors to fulfil their potential and everyone else. Um, the businesses um, of financial advice has historically been cottage industry, you know, so there were some industrialised ones. And indeed, you saw the byproduct of quite a large successful one in your Shadforth sort of, um, you know, witnessing that as a younger person mm. and seeing how you can actually have your cake and eat it. Probably next time round, um, it's going to, there's going to be similar strains, but the big thing is, is that, um, young people and not just young people, but people who are ambitious in our industry, they want to be part of something. They want to be, uh, they want to grow something because they know that if they can actually grow things and, you know, make it a profitable venture, that all those things that they want to do, whether it be philanthropic, whether it be extra services, et cetera, can actually exist if they can execute. On those things, so so when I'm talking to practices um, and they're looking to scale, and we had the conversation off air that that from getting to naught to ten, he says, "This is my opinion, not the the board, just This is my opinion. From naught to ten, you can get there with the charisma of the lead singer." Okay, so you can you can pull off a Freddie Mercury or a Michael Hutchins, and you can bring everyone along, and the clients love it. Then you get into this sort of, and I don't know if EOS sort of flags this, but but um, you get into this sort of uh, awkward teenage years, where everyone thinks you you're big, you've got this great perception, and everyone thinks you're big. Between that, ten and thirty team members, you know, um, and it's hard, it's hard to do that, and without a plan, some people get there eventually. But it just takes a long time and they might have short-circuited it. So if you're where you are today and you want to get to 10 um, – oh, sorry, you want an additional eight advisors and, and, a, and also an additional 800 you know, full-service clients, um, what would you say to the listeners out there would be a reason why they might stop – walking their dog and or their cat. I was told I was accused of being dog-centric in my gags <laughs> recently. So if you, we've got cat walkers out there, you know, <laughs> make yourself known to the, the authorities. Um, 
But what would be if they're thinking, why should I, you know, reach out to you? What what what's the offer as far as the next ten years from from your business? What's your brand promise? Not to the clients, but to someone who wants to sort of hitch their wagon to you. I think as when I left Shadworth to start. Um, Aside private, I did a lot of spent a lot of time soul searching and trying to figure out why I'm doing it. And um, part of that, it was a very difficult decision because I worked in a great organisation with good people, great clients. I was getting paid more money than I needed. Um, and and one of my mentors said, "Why would you leave that to earn nothing or actually be going backwards for a few years? And and what's in it for you?" And there were lots of options that I looked at, whether it was getting another. Uh, advising in a practice where there's equity involved or joining a, a, a boutique firm or, or joining a few advisors and starting something. And what appealed to me about starting from scratch was the ability to build and design an advice offering that could be a better way of doing advice. So right? are, you, are you also then saying that, that you would be open to other people's opinions if they – if they came in and um, uh, sat sat down there and said, here's a few ideas, is that what you're saying? Is it a dynamic process? I think you have to be. And one thing I've learned as I've done this more and more, and particularly bringing Peter into the mix, is that, you know, I think I know everything all the time, but clearly that's not tr- not correct. Just ask my wife. I definitely don't know everything all the time. Um and I'll get so many things wrong. But so I'm we're just learning gonna, that. We're just gonna, we, we can just get a time check of when he's admitted that to his wife. We can just email her <laughs> separately, cut out the first 46 minutes and uh, get straight that's to all, the That's all that matters, isn't it? <laughs> keep going, keep um, going. I'll add some levity. But, but in the, you know, within the team, it's the same. So, so a good example, we were looking at a particular way of um, storing some data, right? And I've got my opinion on it, et cetera, et cetera. And we were debating it as we do in our, um, in our weekly uh, leadership meetings. And, uh, and operational meetings and my, I had a particular position on it and the instinct is that, well, it's my business, I'll decide, right? But Peter actually came up with a better solution and I now realise that what I thought was the best way was absolutely not the best way. And so a re- the really good working relationship that we had is have is that we can get everything out there have a discussion, have a really robust disagreement on particular issues in the way we run business. But ultimately, he is the operations guy and he's going to be better at figuring out the answers to some of, to some of that stuff. Well, there's two aspects to this. One is that he stepped up. The other is that I'm not saying you stepped down, but you stepped sideways long enough to have the mature debate and bring in that other aspect to agree on the way forward. I think when people are looking to scale up their business, if they employ a practice manager or a general manager, a COO, and then inflict on them exactly what they want, then they've just hired an executive assistant. And I think that if you're out there and wondering why you're sort of stuck um, year in, year out and not growing, and you might even have a revolving door of people in that role, well, that's less about them. These people come in highly ambitious they generally come in because they also like helping people, but they may not want to be the person, the lead singer. Um, so, yeah, well done. Well done. Uh, um, and there'll be plenty more. And maybe the more arguments you allow and maybe the more you compromise on, the bigger the business gets faster. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, you're saying well done on doing it, but it definitely didn't come naturally and it doesn't it doesn't come naturally to just do that, to let go. Um, and so that's something that I'm learning every day. Uh, but your, your, your entrepreneurial operating system would be facilitating these conversations as well, wouldn't it? It does. Yeah. yeah. But but how, how many of us, you know, actually execute, right? So the system's only as good as the execution. Um, I know that I need to sleep more, exercise better and eat better. Wrong podcast, champ. <laughs> for me, <laughs> <laughs> and but for me, but, but I don't. Correct. But I don't do it. It's not rocket science. Yeah. But how many of us actually execute? So EOS has a really good structure, but it's so easy for us to just go, ah, bugger that. I'm going to make the call on this because yep. you know. But but it's it, but it's helping us and it's giving us the framework to to force us to to behave and execute in a way that's better for the business. What's and the risks to you then? So what's what's what what do you see? So um, you've kind of laid the platform. You've given your vision statement. What do you see as the risks to your business? The risks are that, well, is it a risk? The risks are that we get it wrong, right, in terms of what we're doing. But we don't we don't get everything right all the time. Yep. 
But we're, we're comfortable with that because we know that by trying certain things, we actually come up with gold yep. out of that by, yep. by trialing some things that don't work. The risk is that, um, that there are periods when we're less profitable. Yep. But that's because we're investing it's in building the that business, capacity cup. Yep. Building the capacity, but also investing time and energy into how can we do things better. Yep. I think if we ever, again, as I said before, to rest on our laurels and think, we've got it all worked out, then we're probably in a bit of trouble because things are constantly changing. Client expectations are changing. Um, there are more and more ways that we can add value. And so empowering the team to look for those ways is um, is really important. But having more voices and more people with different perspectives is critical to to find the best solutions. Like one person, you know, three people is better than one person and, and 10 people is better than three people. So um, from a contributory perspective, it can become chaos if you don't have the structure and the framework. That's where EOS gives us that structure to actually be able to do that. So going back to your point around, would you, you know, would you listen to people or take opinions from people? Um, again, it's something I'm learning to do to, to, to let go of things. Yeah. But hell yeah, you know, that's where we get some some of the best ideas come from other, you know, other people in the team. Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And, and look, when I'm, you know, from, from the perspective of um, uh, your own business right here and what you're looking to achieve, um, you are Melbourne-based. And are you seeing, just, just a, a, a little note I wrote here, is the growth in your business, would you like it? So if I'm listening to this and um, are you going to stay a Melbourne-centric business or do you want to have a bigger footprint or do you have a preference? That's a good question. Um, I think there's pros and cons to, to both. Uh, we referenced COVID before. Yep. Uh, we're two days in the office and three days from home, so we've got that flexible arrangement. But the two days in the office, we're all in together. So that one-on-one people time is important. We certainly don't think it's got to be every day. I do speak to advisors, that, you know, um, who do say, look, I'm a bit old school. I want everyone in the office. Um, but I think – that doesn't work for everyone and and I think we are now in a society and a culture of providing flexibility and that's better for people and the more we can accommodate the personal situations of everyone, the better, more committed people we'll have. It's a tight labour market too. Let's call a spade a spade, right? I could say um, if you want the – so that's, you know, you've got to to match the market. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, But we also have to be there for our clients as well and so – our, having our core values is that's really, right. Really important. They pay us. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, so you say client, I, I sort of say employer. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So um, it's it's getting that balance right, isn't it? The employer employee yeah. um, meeting in the middle. But when we've got our core values, one, one of the things that was really great was we used to have a mission and vision. You know, in the first two or three years of the business, right? And um, you know, some you know three key words that describe us and. After doing EOS, we realized we, we redid those core values and we made them core values, not, not, not coming up with things that sound good to the external market. And I think that's where a lot of businesses get it wrong. They build a mission, vision, values, which are actually things that look good to the outside. Whereas we built core values now, which reflect who we are and everyone in the business has to be the sort of people that demonstrate those core values. In fact, we, um, we insist on it. It's filters. Right. So so you've got to have those right characteristics mm. um, to be part of that team. Yep. Um, and they're all, you, you know, that, that that's how we find the right people um, and, that and, fit in. And when um, – so you are open for people to do that. I'll, I'll just reiterate that. Um, I would like to ask a, a question um, in relation to the vision for the future of uh, how businesses are operating. Um, if you could answer it with, a, you know, any additional knowledge you've got around sort of at the moment you're still um, part of the Board Policy and Regulations Committee and the FAAA. So we set off, off, off air. We didn't really want to speak too much and date this, this, um, this particular podcast. But what's your vision for the future of – how practices arrange themselves. Are you going to see hyper-specialization? You mentioned sharing clients before. I had a podcast um, only recently and and, um, um, and we we spoke about that everyone would love to share clients, but um, the regulation around one AFSL then sharing a client with another AFSL is just messy. So what's your vision for how this, this great and noble profession 
can actually expand fast enough to service all those clients that need it. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I don't, I don't think there's enough of us. Uh, again, I don't think there's enough of us, and there will be enough of us to serve everyone. But I think, as advisors, what we want to get really clear on is who is it? Are we, who is it that we're best serving? And try hard to only serve those people. Yes, and so be very clear. And one thing I always, you know, put, if I look at my wish list and you look at Ensemble, and when you're on that platform, it, we can get quite granular into your, your interests and whatnot. Geez, it'd be good to know every single practice what they were, what they said they were really good at. You know, what's on the sticker? Because um, the the age of the great generalist is finished, right? Because uh, at the end of the day, um, it, it's hard for the consumer to work out, right? So and and they come to you. So um, maybe if a, if a you know Kieran the sound guy, we might be looking at changing the world here one one um, one category at a time. But maybe maybe that's what we take out of it, and and we 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 sort of insist on more practices, saying more specifics about what they do. Because we're a we're a mile, we're a lifetime away from competing with each other. You know, the nature from the mathematics of of the of the demand versus the supply mm. and and I think that that will probably also assist in the public's perception of what we do because quite often you get a broad brush but a financial planner could be someone who's helping with cash flow could be someone who's doing aged care you know these are wildly different sort of clients and also um, uh, outcomes as well so um, yeah that were, that were my, my two cents worth and, and um, uh, anything else you'd like to add regarding um, policy or, or anything exciting yeah, I mean, I think, uh, and, and I heard Danny Visser from Ensemble talking about this the other day as well, that change is only going to keep increasing. Um, and that's the thing that we're most certain about is that change will continue. So whether it's whether it's the current regulatory changes or the, or the regulatory changes that happened 10 years ago or 20 years ago or the ones that are going to be over the coming years, there's always going to be change. And I think as an advice business, again, I, I, I'm saying it quite a bit, but we want to be clear on what our – vision is what our core values are what our purpose is and what we do and if you and i think if we do those things really well then the compliance just sits in the background Uh, whereas i think there's a real opportunity for the industry to move away from a compliance driven business which is most businesses are compliance driven and you look at licensees and um like how we how we help our clients has become less about helping people and our day-to-day for most advisors, particularly when you work in a large organization, is I used to love helping clients and that's why I got into this business, but, I, but I'm really struggling with it. A lot of advisors are struggling because what are they doing? Sales and compliance. And, and, and so that's definitely one thing that we don't, we don't feel. We don't feel like we're selling and we don't feel like compliance is the, the tail wagging the dog. Um, the compliance just happens – um, and advisors get to focus on looking after the client. Well, it's a byproduct of a pretty pretty rigid regime based on, you know, right down to the quarters. So, um, look, I've enjoyed I've enjoyed this this podcast. Thank you very much for coming up to Sydney. Um, and uh, you probably need to um, uh, sort of hurry back there and make sure that actually you don't, because it looks like you've got this great operating system that runs <laughs> with whether or not you're there, right? So, so uh, I often used to say that the, the greatest gift I could give my team who did all the implementation was my absence. It's when they started to agree with me that um, I kind Start of get yeah, worried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. But with that, thank you very much. Um, you've been a great contributor to the industry and also to Ensemble broadly. And thank you very much today for being part of the engine room. Thanks for having me, Roxy. Always love a chat.